In recent times we've seen the drag racing battles between the likes of the Lamborghini Huracan, Audi R8 and Nissan GTR really hot up. I'm here with Jordan who is the driver of the AMS Alpha Omega Huracan which is currently the second fastest in the world running into the 7.3s at 194 mile an hour. Uh, Jordan, I just wanted to find out a little bit more about what actually is required to make a Lamborghini Huracan go this quickly. Obviously no slouch in stock form but no benefit of turbochargers. Uh, what is the first step that was actually taken with the build of this particular car? Well the first step on this car was to get around the factory connecting rods. The weak link in the V10 Audi slash Lamborghini motor would be either like a head gasket or connecting rod. You can ask a lot of those motors. There's people routinely making about 1500 wheel horsepower on those motors. We knew in order to get into the big leagues and actually start chasing ET records, we were gonna need more power than that, obviously. So we first addressed the motor, and then the next thing we got into is actually chassis setup. These these chassis and how you wanna leave and how you wanna short track is so radically different than how a GTR behaves. That was the next big learning curve. Um, some of the early videos are quite comical. Think three or four wheelies going down the track, and you know we, we, we stepped back and we realized like this isn't the type of car to get greedy off the line with just throw as much power as you can before you get into wheel spin. It just wants to pop a wheelie. Traction's not an issue. So we got into some pretty advanced wheelie control with our partners at Motec. Um, additionally, you know, figuring out how to use ballast and selecting the correct tire. Um, also, there was a suspension kit developed with JRZ that helps just damp the chassis down a bit to prevent some of the bouncing. And that got us a lot of ET. So uh, Let, Let's just come back a little bit there because you, you sort of just mentioned the, the GTR platform. And, uh, and we've seen a lot of the, the people that have sort of built up the GTR platform and then have transferred across to uh, Huracan R, R8. So obviously massive difference there in terms of the GTR being front engine versus the mid engine on the Huracan. In terms of the, what you were just saying with the, the setup, that makes a massive difference to how you need to approach getting the car down the strip? Yes, 100%. Like typically with the GTR, you get as greedy as you can off the line with power until you get into wheel spin, right? And that's how you short track those things. Lamborghinis, no way. So first off, you have much more traction because you have the two heaviest components, the drivetrain, the engine and the transaxle sitting directly over the rear axle at all times. You don't need to worry about weight transfer. Traction's unlimited. What's not unlimited is the car's resistance to rotation. I mean, it, if, if you leave too hard, you make a mistake, you're gonna be looking at the sky and dragging the bumper and damaging things. So it's gotta be very careful with big tire, big power. And it's not gonna be a cheap car to be damaging things on. Now, this leads back to what you were saying previously. You mentioned Motec, so I'm going to assume it's running the Motec dual uh, ECU, yes, it is. essentially plug and play kit. You mentioned anti-wheelie, so let's talk about how, how that actually works. What what input is the ECU looking at to know that the front wheels are in the air and how does it combat that? Well, essentially, think traction control, but instead of looking at uh, slip ratio, we're looking at ride height. Okay. So it knows from the ride height, essentially, when the front wheels are about to leave the ground and therefore can reduce engine torque? Yes, exactly. Let's come back to that engine. I mean, one of the big advantages, obviously, the Audi R8 and Huracan platforms have over the likes of the GTR is you've got 10 cylinders instead of six. You've got 5.2 liters instead of 3.8. Now, how, how much of a benefit is that in terms of being able to produce really high horsepower and also produce that with reliability? Are we, are we assuming that the engines are just less highly strung than a comparable GTR? Uh, there's a few things coming into it. Obviously having four more rods and four more sets of valves and all that kind of stuff to take the beating is great, but they also tend to have VE a little higher up in the RPM than the VR38. So to make a given horsepower it requires less torque compounded with the fact that you have four more holes to distribute you know, the beating with. I guess that's the best way to put it. Uh, they're remarkably robust even in their factory stock form. I mean, guys have gone in full weight cars into the high sevens on a factory long block and the long block lives to tell about it. Like that's very impressive. And getting into more of the race oriented stuff with motors that aren't what you'd call you know, heavily built with every single trick in the bag thrown in, factory camshaft still, they're making in excess of you know, 22, 2300 horsepower and generally being pretty reliable. And that's really getting into billet block territory with the GTR and that kind of stuff. And you find you just don't need to go to that stuff as early. I'm sure there'll come a time, obviously, as people are pushing them when that becomes a necessity. For where we are, we've had pretty good luck so far. 
All right, so you mentioned the fact that you changed the rods in that engine, or well, AMS changed the rods in that engine. A at what point, sort of in the in the build up of just adding twin turbos to the stock 5.2 NA engine, obviously you can go so far with that. At what point do, do the rods become a factor that, that needs to be changed out? Really, uh, that's kind of a loaded question because it depends on what turbos you're running, obviously, too. I mean, if you're running a smaller turbo trying to make 1,500 horsepower, those rods are seeing more force than if you were running, like, you know, if you went to, like, a, a G35 1050 and you're trying to make 1,500 horsepower compared to doing it with the G40s, it's going to be easier on the rod. Like, the danger zone is in the 14 to 1,500 horsepower. I mean, there's guys that get away with it for a very long period of time, and there's some guys that don't. Uh, you know, you're, you're working on factory tolerances. How good did, you know, Klaus in the factory torque the heads that day you know is this uh, you know an a is this an a rod or a b rod coming out of the factory i mean you're getting into the margins there and typically for you, you wouldn't really push them that hard but everyone wants to chase a record for the stock motor and you see some pretty wild trap speeds like getting into the i believe the high 170s on a factory long block on a car that weighs roughly four thousand pounds a driver that's a lot of power yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think the important thing for our, our viewers to understand as well is the the cost of replacing a set of rods is a lot cheaper than windowing a block and having to replace a absolutely everything. So there's, there's sort of a reliability element a as well as a, we must do this. Your point there about the turbo size though I think is really valuable to understand because it, it's not just about the power level, it's how the engine produces the power and really as far as the connecting rod is concerned, it, it it's the cylinder pressure uh, that that really is is compressing that rod. So that's one of the failure modes. So yeah, as you mentioned, not black and white. There's not a fix. This is the power level we we must go to a to a uh, an aftermarket rod. Now, in terms of the other elements with the block, with alloy factory blocks, uh, another couple of issues we often come across is uh, the bores flexing, splitting, uh, moving around in other words because of the high cylinder pressures we see with boost. And then those people will go to sleeving the blocks and of course then uh, at the very pointy end there's billet blocks. So obviously you're mentioning that's not necessary where you are at the moment with the Omega. Uh, so far, things are working well with the factory bore, and again, like with the 5.2 motor, I think conventional wisdom was always we sleeve it, and everyone had this mentality where, oh, it's stronger. Uh, but then on the other hand, is it really stronger, or did nobody have the tooling required to deal with like an Alusil or a Nicosil type bore and a, and a ring pack? So we're playing with it, and like this car here is on a factory bore has been into the 740s and 750s numerous times. Uh, 500 miles of normal driving afterwards with no real ill effects. I mean, obviously, are they going to last 100,000 miles? I would probably argue not. But there seems to be a modicum of reliability around the 2,000 horsepower level with the factory bores that we've seen. Um, and if you want to go back to a totally factory long block with factory rotating assembly, they seem to live forever at about 12 to 1,300 wheel horsepower. Which is amazing. That, that's impressive for something that rolled off the showroom floor with what, a, a, around 600 horsepower, am I right? Yeah, exactly, and you're, you're essentially tripling it, and the, you know, the rod is about the size of my thumb. It's just terrifying when you look at the rod and you know, it, and you know what's happening in, at the rear wheels, and it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so bullet blocks are also available for this particular engine. Have you got an idea, obviously I've mentioned, you, you're not there yet, but mm -hmm. people want to go faster and you know, everyone wants to make more power. At what point would, would you consider that's an essential or is it going to be a case of seeing at which point the, the factory block cries enough and gives up? I think that's going to be how it is. I mean obviously there's others out there like UGR that have probably found that limit and they do have established billet blocks and they have the trap speeds to show it in the roll events. I mean I believe also their drag car has gone 218. It's gone much faster than us in a quarter uh, but it's only less than I think it's about a tenth quicker so we're focusing on short track because that's AMS's background is drag racing and making the cars efficient and, and UGR's big trump card is you know they know how to make power they've been doing it a long time and they've done all sorts of events that reward high horsepower like half mile races and that kind of stuff and roll racing which is their bread and butter so it's interesting to see the two different approaches the camps take into you know, chasing after quarter mile times. Yeah, I think that's actually worth focusing on a little bit because it can be really tempting when you're a tuner or an engine builder just strive for let's make more and more and more power and that'll show up with the mile an hour which is great but often and I've, I've been in this situation myself with our Mitsubishi program many years ago making more power can make it a lot harder to actually get the car to 60 foot to, to get out of the hole and I mean there was an old rule of thumb which I think stacks up pretty well that gaining a tenth at the at the 60 foot generally will give you two tenths at the end of the track so yeah you know, what are you focusing on there as a come back to that not hitting it too hard off the line with power that you were mentioning earlier to get that that short track time to, to be as quick as possible 
Yeah, a lot of it comes down to, you know, A, get the correct coilover package for the application, find the right tire. Like, you know, at least on this car, and like Omega, we've had good luck with the JRZ coilovers and there's the adjustability we need to set the cars up for the various tires. And then, you know, as far as like something that would be a little more casual, we have a good 17 inch offering here. Um, otherwise, we prefer for the big pointy end drag stuff, a 15 inch wheel and tire. There's just more options available. From there, it comes into TCM setup, which is absolutely key. So if you nail it, you're gonna be looking at the sky and see braking things. If you don't come in hard enough, you're going to burn a clutch, you're gonna do something. And if you come in just right, it leaves like a dream and you're not wheel hopping, you're not beating things up, just the right amount of slip. And that is an art into itself. And AMS is extremely good with their TCM calibrations, which everyone thinks top line horsepower numbers and you know air fuel ratios and ignition timing, and that's all very relevant to what you're doing. But at the end of the day, like the power delivery in the first 10, 15 feet of the track is gonna dictate how the passes and the short tracks are really gonna have an outsized effect on the ET. And ultimately, how do you want to drag race? Do you want it with mile an hour or ET? Now, talking to others that are involved with DCT transmissions at this sort of upper level, uh, from what I understand, the, the difficulty is that you really can't get as much slip as you would like with these clutches because they are so, so small and you'll sort of burn them up and create heat. So, so that is a, a sort of tightrope you're walking to get out of the hole? That's correct. I mean, if you think about your classic drag setup, the best thing around is a torque converter because you get to have a big speed difference between the crankshaft of the motor and the rear tire going through the gear ratio and it just turns into a little heated fluid and it gets cooled down and everyone's happy at the end of the day. Clutches are a little tougher, especially when you get into the high clamp or the high torque clutches. Like look at some of the dots and stuff with you know, 12, 13 plates. They don't have much more Z height in the stack. So then you get into very, very thin frictions and when you get into that, they just don't have the thermal capacity and so you slip them too much and they get hot and they warp and you've been to clutch and that's no fun. So really everything's very critical with TCM tuning of just the right amount of slip so you're not shocking the drivetrain, you're not knocking the tire loose, but you're also not heating the clutch. And I think at this point, AMS is the best at that. I mean, everyone has their trick and I think short track for sure is AMS's trick. I mean, I don't think anyone is uh, competing with their short track. I mean, obviously there's people making more power out there. We're working on that, we're getting there, but overall, like the packages being put together are quite mature at this point. I mean, I think it's important to understand that once you've got the, the car leaving nicely, it becomes easier then to go faster by adding more power to it. If you've got a car that's already difficult to, to 60 foot and, and it's not really happy getting out of the hole, generally, at least in my experience, just throwing a whole bunch more power at it is only going to sort of exaggerate the, the ill handling problems and, and make your life harder. Does that sort of line up with what your experience is? Yeah, 100%. I mean, typically that's reflected in logs by just less timing because <laughs> you know, it's just traction control keeping you off the wall. Or even sometimes I think people will come out saying, I want a drag race. I'm going to put enormous turbos on them. And they don't have an appreciation then for the knife edge you run on trying to avoid bogging it, but also not blowing the tire off and getting the, you know, getting the car onto boost while you're actually trying to heads up race can be very tough because again, you can't bump into a light against a torque converter with a DCT car, you have to bring it up with exhaust energy. So if your turbos are too big, okay, great. You might be able to sit there at the line for five seconds on launch control, heating up your valves and make a pass for a record, but how are you gonna heads up race that? Yeah, I, I think there's a very big difference between racing for PBs and world records versus a car that is actually competitive and can go laps and beat the person in the other lane. And ultimately, PBs or world records or not, what we're actually doing is racing the person in the other lane. So it's important not to lose sight of that. Uh, so far, we haven't made any mention of the, the turbo package. And I mean, I haven't been involved in one firsthand, but from what I see, the R8s and Huracans are really crying out for turbos. You've got all of this room at, at the back of the engine so compartment. Much room for activities. It's just, just asking for a pair of turbos. So physically, the, the mechanical installation, I'm guessing, is, is not overly difficult. No, it's fairly straightforward. Really, it comes down to, think of a Michelin-starred restaurant. Um, they buy eggs and they buy milk just like everyone else. Um, it's the preparation and the recipe that really determines how the car is gonna run. And if you look at you know, a track record of, okay, there's a lot of guys who have big dyno slips or they can make it through two gears or three gears and show a fast 60 to 130, but that doesn't address how the cars drive when you're not racing them or you know how long the trans gonna last because they're hitting them too hard to the torque convert or how they ET. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that goes into tuning it and keeping a lot of this stuff in house that you just can't export. I think a lot of people are jumping on the V10 bandwagon because you look at it and like compared to a GTR turbo kit, it's physically easier to make, there's more room. So why not make turbo kits? There's actually, it's, it's easier to do, but the tuning's a bit more complex. 
and the chassis are harder to figure out. And I mean, obviously there's a lot of learning still going on in the transmission end because, you know, John Shepard has the GT, you know, the GTR stuff so well figured out stateside here. Everyone's still learning. I mean, that that, uh, that GTR transmission element now is, is fairly mature. There were a yes. lot of problems in the early days, but but now that's pretty well dialed in and there's a number of companies, John obviously one mm -hmm. of them, who are producing pretty reliable transmissions. Not quite at that level with the DCTs out of this platform? No, there's definitely some development to be done yet. And, uh, we've had really good success partnering with Dodson. I mean, we were in the game less than a year before we were able to take the ET record. And a lot of that was, you know, them making the parts that we needed to keep the drivetrain in the car to do it. And, you know, here and there, you know, we'll find a small issue or whatnot. And typically, we, you know, we're the, one of the first people to find it because we're hitting them the hardest. And they've been good about being proactive and addressing things. Yeah, in terms of the, the turbo sizing, can you give us some indication on the likes of the Omega car, what turbos are on that and what sort of boost levels you're using in the deep end where traction isn't an issue? Sure. So uh, right now, everything that uh, AMS builds has Garrett turbos on it for the most part. And uh, right now, Omega is running a set of uh, G42 1450s. And I think it's hitting somewhere in the maybe high 30s boost level to get into the, you know, the, I would say the mid 2000 horsepower range. And again, that sounds like a kind of a low number, but again, you're looking at a 5.2 liter V8 with lots of valves, really good VE. It makes over 100 horsepower a liter from the factory. I mean, the motors are very efficient. It does sound to me on that basis that there's probably a little bit of headroom left, at least in the turbochargers. Is, is that reasonable? Yeah, for sure. But again, until we can uh, get the car to work how we want it, there's no sense in beating the car up to add almost no ET and a few miles an hour. It's just, that's not our mentality. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. All right, if we could sort of look into the crystal ball and, and see where the development sort of starts to, to come to an end, you know, what do you expect in terms of power out of the Omega and where do you see that leading to in terms of ET and mile an hour in the next couple of years? Ideally, it'd be nice to get something starting with a six and maybe 200 and something. I think the car probably has the power at this point to break the 200 mile an hour barrier. But quite frankly, as you know, as I've repeated throughout the interview, we're focused on ET right now and getting the car to work. And then the question is, how many people want that level of package? And you know, are you going to have a lot of people wanting to buy that, or have you taken a car and found out what all the weak links are so you can address the lower end. You know, when I say lower end, that's not a derogatory term, but just people who don't feel the need for a 2,500 horsepower or 2,400 horsepower car. But it's nice to know that somebody has been there and above that and they know what to address before they hand you, you know, a grenade with no pin. Absolutely. I, and I think what you're saying is exactly right. There's only ever going to be a handful of people that want to perform at that sort of level. But I mean, for a company like AMS, it's really a, a show showcase of, of what exactly. they're capable of. And you know, that doesn't matter if you're trying to make 1,200 horsepower, 2,500 horsepower, or anywhere in between. Look, great to, to get some insight into what goes into one of these cars. And uh, Jordan, we wish you all the best for the hunt for that six second uh, ET. Thank good, you very good luck. much. We're going to need luck, but we'll take it. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.